So as I said, there will be a talk today, and um, I'll be taking it. So who can tell us the topic? Water drinker. What is the topic for today's talk? Okay, so we are going to um, remind ourselves of what the teachings of the Catholic Church, the one Holy Roman Catholic Church, what her teachings are with respect to artificial birth controls. I am saying we are reminding ourselves because it is something we should know. At this stage, if you're a Catholic, you should know what the church's position is. Unfortunately, it is a no, no, no. It's as simple as that. No artificial birth controls. No artificial birth controls. And we are going to find out why? Because often that is the question that young people ask. Why? Meanwhile, the young people who are asking the question why, they don't even have the license to have sex. Because sex is for married people. So it's the married people who should be asking why. But the married people, they are in their corner. They are not asking why. It's the young people who are asking why. Maybe when you marry, you will stop asking why. So when we talk about, um, so this will be the outline of what I'm going to talk about. I will explain what artificial birth controls are, give a few examples, and then explain why the church says we shouldn't use them. And then I'll talk about what the church recommends, which is the natural family planning, the NFP. So I'll dwell on that also. And it is my hope that we will seek to understand more what the natural family planning is, understand the methods that are involved in the natural family planning. And for those of you who are preparing to get married, prepare yourself for that. Because I believe that when you put your mind to something, with God's grace, you can achieve it. Anything you put your mind to, with God's grace, you can achieve it. So if already, as you are preparing yourselves for marriage, you are telling yourself that in my marriage, I'll practice natural family planning. In my marriage, I'll practice natural family planning. If you keep telling yourself that, you'll practice it. It will be possible. It will be possible. And we'll talk about why it is possible. So what are these artificial birth controls? We understand them to be any instruments, any instruments, chemicals, or if you like, chemical substances, or bodily actions. When I talk about bodily actions, I'm referring specifically to withdrawal. Only the married people understand what withdrawal is. Those of you who are not married, you may not understand. So, our bodily action with the purpose of preventing conception. So please take note of these, if you like, technical terms. Well, when we talk about 
birth controls, we are talking about preventing conception. And artificial birth controls are instruments or chemical substances or bodily actions that interfere with conception, that prevent conception from taking place. So that is what we are talking about when we say artificial birth controls. There are three categories of artificial birth controls. The first category comes under the title of contraceptives. Contraceptives, that's the first category. And the second category comes under the heading of sterilization. And then the third and final category is abortive. Abortive. Let me explain these three categories. The first one, contraceptives. Contraceptives are artificial birth control methods that seek to prevent pregnancy from happening. So, for instance, if a husband and a wife, whilst they are performing the conjugal act, decide to use an instrument like the condom, for instance, the idea for using it is to prevent pregnancy, to prevent pregnancy from happening. So, at that particular moment, it is a contraceptive. So it comes under the first category. As I said, the first category is to prevent pregnancy. The second category seeks to destroy the capacity to even procreate. For instance, if a wife decides, maybe with a husband, that because they have three, four, five, six children, they don't want to have a gain, so whilst the woman, you know, is delivering the sick child, or after the woman delivers the sick child, the woman tells the doctors to remove her womb. For instance, she will become sterile. She will not be able to conceive again. So the capacity to procreate is destroyed. It is another type of artificial birth control. So that is the second category. Then the third one, which is the abortive, is to eliminate existing pregnancy. It can be one hour pregnancy, it can be one day pregnancy, it can be one week pregnancy, it can be one month pregnancy, it can be three months, it can be five months, it can even be eight months when the intention is to eliminate an existing pregnancy, it is abortive. It is abortive. So if, let's say, you, you are a husband and a wife, and you engage in the conjugal act, and after you engage in it, you realize that you are likely to get pregnant because you look at your cycle and you realize this time you are not safe. Maybe before it didn't occur to you, but after it occurs to you. If you take any medication to get rid of the possible conception, it is abortive. It is abortive. So please take note of it. Don't take these things for granted. Sometimes they sell abortive pills and they tell you they are contraceptives. They are not contraceptives. Contraceptives are the category of artificial birth controls that prevent pregnancy. When the pregnancy has already happened, you cannot talk about contraceptive. Whatever you do to get rid of it is abortive or it's an abortion. So please understand it. The various artificial birth controls that we have include 
the following. It's not limited to them, but it includes the following. I already talked about the redrawal method, which is a bodily action. So if the husband, while he is engaging in the conjugal act with his wife, decides or they both decide that the man should not ejaculate into the woman, the husband should not ejaculate into the wife, but maybe ejaculate somewhere else. That is the redrawal method that we are talking about. There is also the, you let me leave them because if I tell you more about them, you may be having ideas. So there are several of them. Eh? There are several of these. Those that I think you should be careful about, I'll stress them. For instance, this redrawal method, I'm stressing it. And then also the abortive pills, which are being sold as contraceptive pills, I'm stressing them. These are those that I think you should be careful about them. The others, you know them. You know about the condoms. You know about the... Uh, the diaphragm, the loops, the pails, and all those things. You know about those things, which I don't want to. You, I know you just know about them. Not because you have used them. You just know about them because you are very knowledgeable people and you read white. You. Okay, so let's go on. So why, why does the church discourage her members from using some of these artificial birth controls? The first reason is that invariably they are not safe. Okay, these artificial birth controls, except those which will sterilize you for life. They are not safe. They promise that they are safe, but they are not. All the artificial birth controls that are available on the market now, none of them guarantees the percentage of safety that the natural family planning guarantees. The natural family planning guarantees a safety of 98 to 99 percent. 98 to 99 percent. That is how safe it is. That is why I'm encouraging you that as you are preparing to marry, put that in your mind, that you will practice natural family planning if you need to space out your children. Put that in your mind because it is very, very safe. 98 to 99% safe. So that is one of the reasons. Another reason for which the church doesn't encourage her members to use these things is because they only bring about fear and anxiety when couples are engaging in their conjugal act. They are not doing it with joy. They are anxious. They are anxious. That kind of joy that is supposed to be associated with it, that kind of happiness that is supposed to be associated with it, it is missing. The moment you start using these artificial birth controls. Again, they take away what we describe as mutual self-giving. Mutual self-giving. If the husband is using an instrument, for instance, like condom, he is not giving himself fully to the woman. He is not giving himself fully to the woman. Something is missing. Again, the woman is seen as playing the role of pleasing the man. That is also another reason. The woman is just, is just seen as playing the role of pleasing the man. It is about the man releasing at the end, ejaculating at the end, as to whether the wife is also 
fulfilled, he doesn't care. He doesn't care. So he defeats the teaching of the church that in marriage, the man and the woman are equal and they deserve equal satisfaction and they deserve equal happiness during the conjugal act. Again, it is against natural law. It's against natural law. And when, it is, there's a saying that when you sin against God, he will forgive you. When you sin against man, he may forgive you. But when you sin against nature, nature doesn't forgive. Nature doesn't forgive. So any sin against nature, nature will fight back. Or nature will pay back. So the use of artificial birth controls are against natural law. That is not how God designed it. That is not how God designed it. When God created Adam, when Adam opened his hand, there was no condom in his hand. So that is not how God created it. It wasn't part of his creation. There were no trees which were producing diaphragm or pills in the garden. They didn't exist. So that is what we mean by saying it is against natural law. When a man and a woman, when a husband and a wife meets for the conjugal act, it is supposed to be open to procreation. That is why the woman releases eggs and the man releases sperms. It is open to procreation. It may happen, it may not happen, but it's open to it. That is how it is supposed to be naturally. Again, okay, so this is what I just explained. It breaks the natural connection between the procreative and the unity purposes of sex. So the purpose of sex, as far as the teachings of the church is concerned, and as far as the Bible is concerned, is towards procreation. If you, if you look at even the animal world, they don't, they don't engage in sex for fun. They don't. It is for procreation. It is for procreation. So that is the purpose. That is the purpose. Even though in the process, husband and wife can find mutual pleasure. But it is towards that. Again, it turns sex into a non-marital act. The moment people become, or couples become used to artificial birth controls, very soon, the sexual act is no more a marital act. The sexual act becomes entertainment. It's like watching football. You take the remote and you press and you start watching. But that is not what sex is in marriage. Again, it leads to widespread immorality. It leads to widespread immorality. Imagine that on this university campus, if some people decide to put vending machines that would dispense artificial birth, you know, controls. I'm sure some of the machines, they will even crash. You know, like ATM. You just put your ATM card in it and then money comes out. If there were such machines on campus where you can just slot, you know, your ATM, your Visa card, your MasterCard, and then you just pick whatever you want. Nobody is there to watch you. What do you think will happen in this university? I'm sure even at the back of the church, whilst we are here, something will be happening there. So when artificial birth controls are promoted, they lead to widespread immorality. Again, it gives 
human beings the power to decide when a new life should begin, a power that belongs only to God. So when a husband and a wife engage, you know, in the marital act and they are using these artificial birth controls, they are playing God. They are playing God. That is what it is. Again, it undermines the institution of marriage. It undermines the institution of marriage. So I believe I have given you no less than 10 reasons why the church does not encourage the use of artificial birth controls. In fact, the church considers the use of artificial birth controls intrinsically evil. When the church says something is intrinsically evil, it means it is evil by itself. It is evil by itself. So when a couple that has blessed their marriage use artificial birth control, even though for a married couple, sex is permitted and sex is sacred and is allowed, they have sinned. Because the use of artificial birth controls are intrinsically evil. So they have sinned. Please, my dear friends, these things that we are talking about, don't take them for granted. They are very, very important. And it's important that we understand these things. They are not in accord with God's plan for humanity. Some years ago, some of you may be aware some of you may not. Some years ago in China, there was a policy because of their population growth, there was a policy for couples to have only one child. And so they promoted artificial birth controls massively to the point that couples who were ready to undergo sterilization were compensated financially. So, for instance, if you, the man, you decided to be sterile, maybe they took away your testicles so that you can no longer produce sperms, the government can, let's say, give you a house for that. The woman, if you opted to have your womb taken out, maybe the government will give you a car for that. So, things like that. So you have only one child, and after that, you were supposed to go on artificial birth controls, all the methods that were available. After some years, they came back to realize that in a short time, there will be no China. Their demographers came back to realize that that one-child policy will cause them to be extinct. In some years to come, there will be no Chinese. Because, let me give you a very practical scenario. We are 10 sets of couples, and then we all give birth to one child, okay, each. And five of us, after we give birth, let's say all the 10 of us, we went through some form of sterilization. So we can no longer have children. We have just one child each. And then in the process, five of the children die. Which can happen. Maybe through sickness, through an accident, something. But out of the ten children that we have as ten couples, five of them die. So only five grow up to marry. And it happens that out of the five that marry, three of them are not able to have children for some strange reason. They are not able to have children. So only two can have children. And these two who can have children, they are supposed to give birth to one child each. 
So in the next few generations, maybe in 50 years to come, or in 70 to 100 years, these 10 couples that we are talking about, they will not have grandchildren, they will not have great-grandchildren. When they die, that is the end. So imagine if they were the only people in China. It means in those number of years, there will be nobody there. They will all be gone. So even for a country that is having such a huge population and they thought they should control it, they realize that that one-child policy will not help them. So they've scrapped it. But unfortunately, those who have been who have undergone sterilization, they've undergone it. It can be reversed. If they cut off your balls, you can't have artificial balls. They are gone. They are gone. So these things that we are talking about, I believe the church, in her wisdom, guided by a long tradition and interaction with God's word, is teaching us modern people that we cannot use them. They will destroy us. They will destroy us. So it's important for us to understand that. And when I talked about the fact that it is against God's word, if you look at a scripture passage like Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, where God created a man and a woman and he blessed them, what did God say? He said, be fertile and multiply. So when we are doing things artificially, that will interrupt this process of multiplication, then we are acting against God's word. We are acting against God's word. So we need to understand that. However, the church teaches as an alternative the natural family planning because the church realizes that it is not possible for a married couple to, you know, have come together in the conjugal act and at each stage or at each point, a child results from that. They may not be able to take care of all the children that they are going to have. So the church proposes for such couples the natural family planning. And as I said, research has been done which supports the fact that the natural family planning is the most safe one or the most safe method. 98 to 99% safe. And what is the natural family planning? The natural family planning is based on an inbuilt indicator of fertility or infertility in a woman's body. So medical research has been carried out to know that at a certain point in a woman's cycle, when she engages in the marital act, she will not conceive. She will not conceive. Those periods are called the safe periods. Sometimes some people give the excuse that they are unable to monitor their safe periods. My response to that is they've not put their mind to it. If they put their minds to it, they can monitor the safe periods. Or maybe they don't even know how to calculate it. So if you are here and you're a married couple and you want to know how to calculate it, you can see me. I will teach you how to calculate it. But I'm not going to teach you the students. Because... You are not ready to marry yet. You are still in school. So when you complete school and you want to know how to calculate it, you can come, I'll teach you. It's very simple. These days, crowd, there are apps. There are apps that are used to calculate it. So it's on your phone. All you need to know is when your menstruation begins and when it ends. That's all. When you put in the, the time or the date when your menstruation begins and put in the date that your menstruation ends over a period of three to four months, the pattern will be 
will be there. It will develop the pattern for you, and it will tell you when you are safe and when you are not safe. So it is not something that is difficult. So for my couples, we are made to understand that if you have, for instance, a 28-day cycle, a 28-day cycle means that when you have your first menstrual period, the next time you have it is 28 days. So if you have a 28-day cycle, the number of days out of the 28 that you are safe, which when you have sex with your husband, you won't conceive, are uh, 15. 15 days. 15 days in a month. You can engage in sex with your husband for baku 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 15 days. Is it not enough? Okay, I'm asking the married couples. Is it not enough? It's enough. 15 whole days. I th honestly, I think it's enough. I think it's enough. I mean... You can't do it for 30 days. It's not possible. Not even during your honeymoon. You, you, you can't. You'll be tired. And you may, you may hurt somebody. So that is what the church teaches, that the natural family planning is the best. The natural family planning also has some methods. And one of them is what I talked about, the calendar method where you use your cycle days to calculate your sleep period. There is also the temperature method. The temperature method is a little complicated because sometimes your temperature can go up not because you are ovulating, but because you are not well. So maybe you are getting fever. And as a wife, you check and you feel that, oh, based on my temperature, I'm safe. If you do it, you'll get pregnant. And then the fever will also come. So it may be fever you are getting, and not the fact that uh, the temperature is indicating that you are safe. The third one is the mucus. The mucus method is also there. That one too, if you want to understand it as a married couple, if you come and see me, I will explain it to you. Now, what are the advantages of the natural family planning? The advantages of the natural family planning are one, scientifically, they are sound, or it is very sound, scientifically. It doesn't involve any chemical, it doesn't involve any instrument, it is, it is just scientifically sound. It makes sense. It makes sense because you are only following the natural cycle of a woman. It's as simple as that. So it is, it is not acting against nature. It is knowing nature and working with nature. That is what it is. It is knowing and understanding how nature operates. Because, for instance, when it comes to the weather in Ghana, we have the rainy season and the dry season. You don't sow your crops in the dry season. How will it get water? So you sow your crops in the rainy season, and then you get water, and then your crop can grow. So that is it. It is following the cycle of nature. So that is why they say that it is scientifically sound. Number two, it is free of any bad side effects. The artificial bed controls, they have serious side effects. Some of them can cause itching. Serious ones. Some of them can cause the woman to be infertile in the long run, especially women who use pills. I know a couple that is struggling to have a second child because after their first child, they decided that the woman should go on pills. And they can't have a second child anymore because the pills messed up the woman's cycle. So they can't have a child anymore. 
So these are side effects of the artificial birth controls, which the manufacturers will not tell you because it's a multi-million dollar industry. People are making serious money from it. So why should they tell you that this will happen to you in 10 years' time? This will happen to you in five years' time. They won't tell you. And the natural family planning is free of such things. If you follow it faithfully, you can space out your children. And whenever you want to have a, children, a child by the grace of God, if you also follow it in a proper method, the woman or your wife will conceive. So the natural family planning is not just to prevent pregnancy. It is also to ensure pregnancy. If you want your wife to get pregnant, if you study a cycle, you can do it at a time when she will get pregnant, most likely, if everything is okay. Again, the natural family planning is ethically acceptable. There is no community that does not accept it. There is no religion that does not accept it. Every religion accepts the natural family planning. Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, every religion accepts the natural family planning. So it's ethically acceptable. Again, the natural family planning doesn't have moral issues. There are no moral issues involved in the natural family planning. When a couple engages in the conjugal act using the natural family planning, they are not committing sin in any way. So there are no moral issues involved in that. Again, it is healthy. So the couple will not have any health issues. Some of the chemicals that some married women use to prepare themselves for the conjugal act just to prevent pregnancy, some of them have health implications. Some of them, some of the cancers that women are having, some of them are as a result of these artificial birth controls. But like I'm saying, those who are making them, they won't tell you. They won't tell you. I've talked about the fact that it is safe. And in addition to it being safe, it is effective. It works. It works for those who are able to study and understand it very well. And then finally, it is inexpensive. You don't have to pay any money. You don't have to pay any money. You don't have to go to the drugstore to go and buy anything. It's just in the house. So it's inexpensive. What are the benefits of using the natural family planning? One, it helps with self-control, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It helps with self-control because the truth, of the, the truth of the matter is that even for married couples who decide that they are going to use artificial birth controls, it is not every time you can engage in the conjugal act. When your wife is sick, you can't do it. When your husband is sick, you can't do it. When your wife is pregnant, at the latter stages of the pregnancy. You can't engage in the conjugal act with her. You will kill the baby. So you can't do it. So even for couples who decide to use artificial birth control, it's not every time that you can do it. Okay, that is why one of the benefits of using the natural family planning is that it's builds self-control. Because you know that from this time to this time, your wife is not safe. From this time to that time, your wife is safe. So whilst you are waiting, you are controlling yourself. And it is an exercise towards a time when it will be naturally impossible.
to engage in the conjugal act. When your husband travels abroad, for instance, what are you going to do? When your wife goes for some Christian mother's program, three days, one week, you follow her to the Christian mother's program, you can't do that. You can't do that. So this thing that we are talking about, self-control, is very important. That's one of the benefits of the natural family planning. It helps to build self-control in those who practice it. Another benefit is that it also builds within you the spirit of sacrifice. So when your wife is not safe and you don't want to engage in the conjugal act which will result in pregnancy, you sacrifice for her. You sacrifice for her. So it also builds a spirit of sacrifice. There's also consideration for one own spouse, like your partner, if your, your wife, you show consideration to her that at this period, naturally, she is not safe. So you, 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 are, you take it easy with, with her. So that is also something that um, comes as a benefit, consideration for your, your partner. It also shows reverence to God's law. Shows reverence to God's law. If you read from um, Genesis chapter Genesis chapter 38, verse 9, the story of Onan, which uh, is often quoted against the redrawal method or generally the artificial birth controls. That is one thing that um, it prevents you uh, from doing. So it, it shows that the person has respect for God's law. God's law doesn't promote the use of artificial birth controls. It is the natural family planning that it encourages or it promotes. Again, another benefit is that there is satisfaction in the fulfillment of one's responsibility. When you are able to follow the natural family planning, you engage in the conjugal act with satisfaction, with peace of mind. And it makes the involvement of the couple, it makes their, it makes their involvement mutual and it heightens their satisfaction. So there's no fear there, there's no worry there, there's no anxiety. There's no anxiety. Again, another benefit is that there's a sense of gratitude for the graces one receives in marriage. So you are, you are happy with the blessing of marriage, and you come to appreciate that this can only take place in marriage. So if you have been given the gift of marriage, you are happy with it, and you give thanks to God for that. So these are some of the benefits that the natural family planning brings to those who practice it. So I'll end here so that if um, any of you have any question, we can deal with them. But as I'm saying, there are certain things that I think you don't need at the moment. Those that you need, I've tried to explain them to you as students. The rest, I think they are for married, they are for married people. So... We will leave them at that. Any, any question? If you have a question, just come forward, take the microphone, and then ask. And let me also say this before I forget. As young people, one of the gifts that you can ask God for is the gift of self-control. Because in our generation, it is very, very, very easy to have sex. It is very, 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 very easy, unlike in the past. Now, it is very, very easy. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. In the past, there were no universities. So you were likely to stay with your parents until you, you were married. Now, you come to the university, 
you are on your own. Some of you, you have your own rooms. Some of you at the weekend, your roommates are gone. You are alone. And some of you, your boyfriends come and sleep in your rooms. Or your girlfriends come and sleep in your rooms. Anything can happen if you don't have self-control. So that is why I'm saying that in, in your generation, it is very, very, very easy. So as a Christian, as somebody who fears God, the gift you should ask for is self-control. If you have the gift of self-control, you can have a girlfriend as a university student, you can have a boyfriend as a university student, you have nothing to worry about because you know you are not messing up. You know you are not messing up. It is waiting for you. When you marry, it is there. Why do you start eating something that you eat tomorrow? Why do you want to do that? It's there for you. So why do you want to start eating it now? And it's not like you are even hungry. You are not hungry. You are only, <laughs> you are only eating it for pleasure. So please, let's, let's take these things serious. Any, any question? Okay, so let's, um, let's take our announcement. If anybody has something to ask, which is personal, you can see me afterwards and ask. I'll be glad to answer you. So we'll take our announcement, and then after the announcement, those who are celebrating their birthdays will come forward for a blessing. 